Hello, greetings from Washington, DC. I'm very happy to welcome our global audience today. Welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. My name is David Young. I'm USIP's Vice President for Applied Conflict Transformation. USIP is an independent nonpartisan national institute. We were founded by the US Congress in 1984. Supporting youth peace builders is one of USIP's greatest priorities. That's why I'm particularly excited to welcome you to this forum, which is devoted to the fifth anniversary of UN Security Council Resolution 2250 on youth, peace, and security. In our program today, we will reflect on the progress that has been made on the YPS agenda and the challenges that remain. USIP seeks to work with youth as critical stakeholders and partners at all levels of peace building. We do this through our Generation Change Fellows Program. The program trains youth leaders on leadership, the reduction of prejudice, and the transformation of conflict. We aim to increase the ability of leaders to transform conflict at the local level, and also to reduce the isolation they may feel as peace builders. The program currently has about 300 fellows from 26 countries across Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America. We're fortunate that today, two of our panelists are alumni of the Generation Change Fellows Program. These colleagues, Lorena and Midrul, also serve on USIP's Advisory Council for Youth. The council is built on the belief that youth bring distinct and important insights to peace building. The council also elevates youth voices and experiences into international forums where in the past, youth representatives have been too few. If you're interested in hearing more about today's topic, please attend tomorrow's virtual session at PeaceCon, which USIP is co-hosting with the Alliance for Peace Building. You can get inf more information on tomorrow's session at allianceforpeacebuilding.org. Before I turn over the podium to my USIP colleague, Rebecca Ebenezer Abiola, I'd like to share a dedication. I dedicate today's forum to the memory of Congressman John Lewis. Representative Lewis passed away last July at 80 years of age. He was one of the great civil rights leaders in the United States and he was a good friend and strong supporter of USIP. While still in college, the young John Lewis was already a leader in the student movement that sought to desegregate America's public spaces. He was the chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which in the US was the only national civil rights organization led by young people. At the time, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, an, electri an electrifying movement of Negro students has shattered the placid surface of campuses and communities across the South. Though confronted in many places by hoodlums, police guns, tear gas, arrests, and jail sentences, the students tenaciously continue to sit down and demand equal service at variety store lunch counters and extend their protests from city to city it is no overstatement to characterize these events as historic. Never before in the United States has so large a body of students spread a struggle over so great an area in pursuit of a goal of human dignity and freedom. This past summer's global protests for racial justice were also led by young people. A few days after Representative John Lewis's death, the New York Times published his farewell note, which really reads like a letter to young peace builders. Representative Lewis wrote, while my time here has now come to an end, I want you to know that in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story, when you used your power to make a difference in our society. Then reflecting on his college days, Representative Lewis continued, like so many young people today, I was searching for a way out, or some might say a way in. And then I heard the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on an old radio. 
he was talking about the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence. He said, we are all complicit when we, in, when we tolerate injustice. So when you see something that is not right, you must say something, you must do something. Democracy is not a state, it is an act. And each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself. And then Representative Lewis closed with these words. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I've done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last, and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Thus, as we celebrate the fifth anniversary of Resolution 2250, let us celebrate the life of the young John Lewises around the world. And let us redouble our support for youth peace builders wherever they are courageously working. I'd like to thank Rebecca and her colleagues at USIP, Paula Poras, Paul Lee and Allison Milovsky for driving USIP's work on youth. And I thank Lorena Midril and Cecil for their leadership and for joining us today. And now over to Rebecca, who's usually based in wet and steamy Lagos, but who's currently studying in wet and chilly Aberdeen, Scotland. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you very much, David, for those inspiring words. As David mentioned, tomorrow, December 9, marks the 50th anniversary since the adoption of the first ever UN Security Council resolution on youth peace and security. That's UNSCR 2250. Prior to 2250, there was no comprehensive framework with which to address the specific needs and opportunities of young people. Resolution 2250 filled this gap by providing a framework for viewing, addressing, designing, and evaluating peace building activities involving young people. This policy framework focuses on five action areas that make up the youth peace and security agenda. These are particip participation, protection, prevention, partnership, and disengagement and reintegration. SCR 2250 has been followed by two other resolutions on YPS. Uh, these are SCR um, 2419 in 2018 and SCR 2535 in 2020. And all these resolutions are calling for and emphasizing on the need for full youth participation in peace processes. So it's been five years since 2250. What progress have we made? What barriers still exist? And what opportunities can we explore as we continue to strive for meaningful youth inclusion in all aspects of peace building interventions? To help us unpack these issues are three peace builders that are joining us today. They are Lorena Gomez, Mridul Upadie, and Cecile Mazakurati. Lorena is a youth peace builder from Colombia. In addition to serving as a member of the USIP Youth Advisory Council. She's also a social entrepreneur, travel builder, and a journalist with a focus on ecotourism. I think you can see from her background. Ridu um, is serving his second term with the USIP Youth Advisory Council, and is also a Generation Change Fellow from India. Ridu is the Asia Coordinator of the UNOY and the co-founder of Youth for Peace International. Uh, last but not least is Cecil Mezakurati, who is the head of the Secretariat on Youth Peace and Security at uh, UNFPA and represents the United Nations Peace Building Support Office as the co-chair of the Global Coalition on Youth Peace and Security. Thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. And for all of you who are watching this webcast, remember that you can follow us on social media with today's hashtag. That's um, hashtag UNSCR2250. And if you have a question, please use the, uh, use the chat box function located just below this video player on the USIP events page. 
So let's get started. Um, Cecile, um, can you walk us through the journey of the adoption of the first resolution on YPS? How did it come about? What prompted it? And who was involved? Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, USIP, for organizing this event. Happy birthday to Resolution 2250. It's really exciting to already be celebrating this fifth anniversary. And so five years ago, the adoption of Resolution 2250 took everyone by surprise. The Kingdom of Jordan, who had a seat in the Security Council at that moment, had committed to getting a resolution on young people adopted. But nevertheless, it seemed really far-fetched. We all know that the Security Council can be very divided, uh, including among its permanent members. The Council had said very little about young people. And as we know, in international fora, it's very hard to get new language adopted in, by member states in resolution. So it didn't seem at all uh, frankly, likely that it would happen. So it really was a feast <laughs> when, when the text was, was adopted. It really was a momentous achievement by um, the, the Kingdom of Jordan, who was able to bring together the members of the council and get the resolution unanimously adopted. A resolution that included a lot of new language around young people and peace, including language coming from young people, young people themselves, um, and from, in particular, the Amman Youth Declaration, which had been adopted by hundreds and thousands of young people around the world the previous summer. And that's really where youth peace and security and the resolution comes from. It comes from young people. It comes from young peace builders throughout the world who, for years before uh, the adoption of 2250, lobbied their government, lobbied international um, non-governmental organizations lobbied the United Nations people like me to say we need a text that would say young people have a place at the table. We need a resolution similar to the Women, Peace and Security Resolution, Resolution 1325, because we see how for women's groups and women peace builders, they can really use it to engage with their government. Um, and so it's young people that started this process um, with various organizations at local level, at international level. The United Network of Young Peace Builders, which Muridol is a member of, was um, really leading the charge. It's a network of youth peace building organizations and uh, their members were very engaged and, and really started this movement. Another key constituency was um, international peace building organizations, non-governmental peace building organizations. What is now called youth peace and security really come, really came from the youth peace building field. And for peace building organizations, it, will, it was always very clear that you can, you can only build peace working with local actors, including young women and men. And so pushed by these two main constituencies, slowly, um, the UN system, member states got interested and started getting engaged. And at first, it really was just um, a network of individuals in various organizations who all got interested and committed and decided basically to join forces and create this partnership beyond um, uh, organizational structures to push this discussion and help push the call of young people. So we created uh, an interagency platform, which is now called the Global Coalition on Youth, Peace and Security, which originally was called the Interagency Working Group on Youth and Peace Building when it was first created uh, in 2012. Really or, already at that time with the idea, again, pushed by young peace builders, that a resolution was what they wanted. At that time, adopted a re adopting a resolution seemed really far-fetched. So we developed guiding principles um, um, overarching principles that should guide our engagement with young people and peace building, be gender sensitive, protect young people, um, reach out to the most marginalized, ensure diversity of young people are engaged. And these also help pave the way towards the, the, the adoption of the resolution. So in the end, it really is, I think, the illustration of the famous quote by Margaret Mead, never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has because it really was this small coalition of various individuals that was eventually able to get the resolution adopted. Thank you, Cecil. Uh, Lorena, let me come to you. As a young person from Colombia, 
What is the significance of 2250 to you? How has it impacted your peace building work? Well, um, I want to first uh, say hello to everyone who's uh, online and yeah, welcome you all. Thank you for being here. And, and yes, I guess my answer to that question has a story behind because uh, this resolution came to my life in, in July, 2018. Because I didn't really know about the resolution before, but then uh, there was a UN officer, his name is Mauricio Artiña Artignano, he's from Costa Rica, and he works with the UN verification mission here in Colombia. And uh, he decided to activate the res this resolution in order to do something with the FARC, with FARC guerrilla transition base camps. So he wanted to help them activate their local projects. And he used the resolution to enable the UN to lend us the helicopters. And uh, he called upon a group of youth peace builders and social entrepreneurs who could support um, and help activate their projects. So he called a big group of ours. And uh, thanks to him we, and the resolution, we were able to travel to these areas. I went to, to one of the areas who were really at the heart of conflict in Colombia, um, the name of the place is El Caguan. Normally, Colombians are usually quite scared uh, about going there, but it felt good to feel that the UN was with us. We, we felt secure enough in order to access the place. And then we were the first visitors of this uh, rafting project that has been growing after our visit. And that was the first time I came really into intimate touch with uh, former guerrilla combatants. Um, and uh, it, was an, um, it was an important experience also to me, not only as a Colombian, uh, because it meant a lot to see that place from a different perspective and understand these people's point of view, but also professionally, because it enabled me to see the challenges that are, that haven't been noticed yet in tourism and post-conflict projects. And that is uh, that mainly these tour guides, emerging tour guides, they really lack, um, they, don't, they need to strengthen their interpersonal communication skills in order to um, create conversations that inspire oneness instead of division. Because everybody, especially Colombians, when you visit the place, there's a lot happening in between at an emotional level. So um, meeting them was very illustrative for me. And that was the first opportunity that allowed me to notice that, develop concepts and some work around that topic, like thinking of the psychological process all these new tour guides um, want to develop because they also want, them, want it as well for them to tell their stories and manage difficult conversations um, and have a tourism narrative that connects everyone and avoids conflict or prevents it by, by generating a proper context um, and humane connection. So um, it was actually amazing because three years later, I was hired by this same social project. Uh, they are now a social enterprise called Caguan Expeditions. And they hired me because I had the experience no one else had before to assess them uh, as someone who works in ecotourism and narratives. So I just last October, I was able to go back and use all that previous experience to assess them. And since there was trust already, uh, I was able to share with them three weeks and have a lot of coffees and understand them well and help them build the narrative. So a, really this resolution ended up being a chance for me to access a new part of Colombia, uh, not only regionally, but also the the opportunity to work with a new community because I, I had always worked with indigenous people but there is a completely different approach when you go to well, another group and uh, so they have a very special dynamic and that that also impacted my peace building work because I learned uh, this strategy was not about doing workshops but rather having a lot of night coffees with them uh, with long conversations about life so yeah, I would say that's uh, how it has impacted. And last but not least, um, 
Well, it also, it also showed me in the process I realized because I am young and <laughs> I am a peace builder because I normally didn't used to call myself like that. I just did my work. <laughs> but then I realized uh, this resolution exists and there is a whole movement, an entire movement around youth, like using these two keywords opens a lot of doors. And that's how I also got engaged in a program that the University of Georgetown organizes for Latin American leaders, youth leaders, and also with the USIP. So uh, I, I'm personally very thankful to that resolution because it opened a whole new world for me. Thank you, Lorena, for sharing those personal stories. Uh, Ridu, let me come to you. How would you say the role of young people have changed in peace building interventions? And what has 2250 got to do with that? Sure, thanks, uh, Rubika. So as uh, it has been previously mentioned by Cecile and uh, Lorena, young people were, and young people are, um, anyway doing a lot of peace building work. Uh, despite all the barriers that they were facing or uh, if they are getting supported or not. So I would not say that the role has changed. Role is still the same. Young people are contrib uh, contributing to peace building interventions. What has changed is something else. So why we wanted this resolution was that young people were asking for recognition and support so that they can do more work, so that they can get protected, so that their voices uh, can make uh, direct changes in the institutions and in the systems. And that is uh, happening slightly. And UNSCR 2250 actually uh, became that global consensus on young people's positive role in peace building. Um, so yeah, that mindset change, I think that is something what UNSCR 2250 has brought. Before that, there was nothing. Uh, we, we kept saying there was some research uh, that we kept showing to the people uh, to the stakeholder that young people are doing at large young people are um, coming from positive inten uh, in, uh, intentions and contributing to peace building but uh, this resolution actually became that global consensus and the five pillars of uh, UNSCR 2250 which is participation uh, protection partnership uh, participation uh, and uh, uh, disengagement and reintegration. These five pillars actually became uh, the key uh, important thematic directions of recommendation to advance the youth peace and security work. So uh, yeah, the role of young people hasn't changed, but how other stakeholders are uh, engaging young people, that has uh, started changing slightly. Thank you, Maridol. And I can say that that's some progress that has been made. If um, engagement with the, uh, if the way other stakeholders are engaging with young people have changed, that's some significant progress. Um, Cecile, I wonder if you can articulate some other progress that have been made in the YPS space since 2015, when this resolution was adopted. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, I'm, to me, the most significant progress is when it has when we see that the resolution has had an impact on young people's lives, you know, including their individual experiences, like the one we just heard from Lorena, I think it's, it's a great story. Um, if we take a more macro level perspective, so what has changed, I think significantly is the narrative about young people's relationship to peace and security. We, thanks to, again, young people's advocacy primarily, and with the help of the resolution, we shifted from a predominantly negative discourse about young people as a threat for peace, which generally had um, a subversion, which is youth unemployment as a global threat for peace, towards a positive narrative, recognizing that it's only ever a minority of young people who are engaged in violence, that in all contexts, the majority of young people are peaceful and want to go on with their lives like everyone else. They want to go to school, they want to have a job, they want to have a family, and that some of them are doing tremendous peace building work that has not been recognized, funded, and supported enough. And that narrative 
which was not at all the dominant narrative in 2014 and even in 2015 and even in 2016. I think now we've really seen an evolution. We see much less um, automatic association of young people and violent extremist groups, of youth and employment as, as a problem for peace. I think the narrative has been really refined and really everyone has seen that actually evidence tells us that young people are peaceful and that we should be focusing on that. So that I think is the most significant progress. With that came, of course, the political buy-in. It started in the Security Council, but we saw it growing well beyond the walls of the council with wide support from um, numerous member states, which of course is very important because that's part of the reshaping of this narrative. And most importantly, of course, is the progress and impact at field level. Um, and so we've seen more um, um, interventions, programs supporting the work of young people. I think we've seen much better programming. Um, in part of the work um, I do is to work with our um, field uh, colleagues in developing um, uh, programs on youth peace and security. And we see a lot less of, let's create a network of young people <laughs> and a lot more of, they are young people who are active for peace. Let's find them, let's see what they need. Let's see how we can support them. Let's put in place mechanisms that are sustainable and durable and that do not create um, top-down approaches, but that, that are really supporting bottom-up approaches. I think another um, important indicator of progress has been the building of coalitions on youth peace and security. Um, and we've seen coalitions at the national level in a number of countries, Jordan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Nigeria, India, as um, Ridul knows <laughs> more than uh, anyone um, and many others, they are regional level coalitions. And these coalitions who are bringing together partners, again, from uh, civil society, from government counterparts, from the UN, have really been instrumental in pushing the agenda at, at regional level. Now, I want to say a couple of things that I think have not progressed enough because it's important to keep that in mind as we enter into this new phase. And two things in particular. The first one is funding because we can talk about youth peace and security as much as we'd like if we don't actually support the efforts of young peace builders, we're not going to get really far. And we know a lot of the youth peace building work is done by very small organizations that might not even be an organization, might not have a bank account, might not have a structure, but nevertheless, it's you know a lot of volunteers who are full of great ideas. How do we support them for the fantastic work that they do? And that is still really a glaring gap, I would say, of the youth peace and security agenda. And the other areas where things have not progressed, where actually things have gotten worse, I think, is the protection of young peace builders. It's always been an issue. Young peace builders, young and old <laughs> human rights activists have always been under threats. But we've seen in the past year an important restriction of the civic space. We all know it, and we've seen it directly on young peace builders. We've seen an increase in the threats and harassment they face. We know that young peace builders who are also directly engaging with the international community, with the United Nations and with others are being directly threatened and punished for that. That I think is a dramatic evolution and really something we need to prioritize going forward. That's such an important point to touch on that even though we've made so much progress, there are still some areas that still need a lot of work. And Ridul, I, I wonder if you can speak more to that uh, from a young person's perspective. What are those barriers that still exist? Um, Cecil has mentioned quite a few, but from your own per um, perspective, at the national and um, community level, what would you say are some of the barriers that still exist to meaningful youth um, involvement, meaningful youth engagement in peace building? Sure. Yeah, so I think Cecil has already uh, pointed out a few. Um, I will just try to uh, like picture this in two ways. One is the micro uh, kind of things and one is macro kind of things. So if you want to understand the macro kind of things, then you can read the resolutions. The five pillars, those were existing barriers. Those were the challenges. And that's why we wanted to have this resolution. So how much participation is happening? Who is participating? Are young people being able to participate socially, economically, um, and uh, at a meaningful and active level in the decision-making? That's there, uh, and politically, of course. 
so uh, then um, how much partnership is happening between the stakeholder to do peace building work and how young people are contributing to that uh, the protection of young peace builders that is already mentioned um, and then uh, is the prevention part um, how much we are working on the prevention instead of let's say mitigating the uh, the effect of it and what are the strategies of prevent uh, is it countering part or is it preventing or actual let's say um, whole of society approach uh, from the very beginning uh, that kind of prevention and then the disengagement and reintegration so all of these pillars are itself um, an answer to some of the challenges which were identified so that's one now going deeper um, into these conversations so funding protection uh, these things are already mentioned i will just slightly uh, elaborate on these points let's talk about participation itself so the important thing about participation is uh, that um, okay i'll come to the implementation part uh, later but in order to ensure meaningful and active participation in decision making young people actually need to have some kind of representational role right like in a country like india where we are having 400 million young people these 400 million young people themselves cannot directly engage in decision making so they need to have uh, a consultation done uh, with young people uh, we need to identify priorities a coalition need to be built a research need to happen all of these kind of things are uh, need to happen but young people are not trusted with big consultations or running a network or running uh, a coalition uh, this is left with big organizations ingos so you know if young people are not supported for research and for running these consultation how young people will be able to uh, identify the national level priorities uh, and be able to introduce it to the decision maker so that's the kind of approach uh, that, that's one um, barrier uh, which we are facing in the community now going to okay just adding to it which i would wanted to even bring later which is even if let's say we are having these priorities with us uh, what is happening now uh, with these resolution we are talking a lot about implementation so the advocacy can be very much right based where we are like okay we are the young people this is our issue so please give us space uh, and we want to decide for ourselves so it's a very right based but unfortunately it seems that implement implementation cannot be right based implementation looks merit based whoever has the resources whoever has the capacity they will be implementing so now when we are talking about implementing of unscr 2250 there young people can be sidelined or token uh, tokenized very easily it's like if you have the resources if you have the understanding of how the implementation need to happen then only you will engage in the decision making of the implementation so that's also a barrier around participation uh, going further the second part is protection which is already uh, mentioned and this protection is not only limited to uh, like political protection but social and economic protection as well like once someone start working in peace building field if that the volunteering is the only option for them it's not only the brain drain happening after some time but it is the peace building potential drain happening young people very early starting uh, volunteering with uh, organizations doing a lot of peace building work but then they feel, then they see that they, there is no uh, like future uh, in this field they are not able to earn their livelihoods in this and they had to switch to some other field these amazing young people you see and you get very disappointed when your team members are leaving because we cannot sustain them because our organization is zero budget initiative or we are not able to raise the fund and that's a very huge thing second part is social uh, protection as well so uh, the society itself it's the idea of how young people are seen as opportunist Uh, as someone who are doing this uh, work to to join UN or uh, to attend conferences and this narrative itself that the the trust of community is not there so that kind of protection actually harms young people a lot when we are having any partnership the trust when we don't see it it just demotivates us a lot 
so these like other than the physical protection and sorry physical and mental protection is also very important reason being one more thing because uh this protection if if you are talking about human right defenders then they still have some kind of support groups but young people support group is not there still so global coalitions thematic working group is working on that creating that kind of support group for young peace builders uh, but that is something that we need to work on and the last part is funding of course uh, that that like contributes to a lot of things so i would like to follow up on what cecil and ridol have mentioned about some of these barriers you've mentioned funding lack of resources protection what would be your recommendation for overcoming these barriers and any of you can answer lorena ridol cecil what us what would be your recommendation there are already recommendations i think not just from theory of us but 4230 young people we have this independent uh, progress study on youth peace and security the missing piece uh, young people from all over the world have called different stakeholder for the kind of things that they want the kind of implementation that they want how inclusive it should be uh, what can be the guiding principles um, th that is also lined up it just now we need to act on it uh, different stakeholder need to do a little bit more uh to be able to work on it i think that that's my feeling when i see lorena now uh, i think there's a um, sort of an approach that might be missing it's not only about participation participation is not just giving a chair to someone and have nominal participation you know it's really how to have intergenerational dialogue which i think is an approach we're probably missing because it is also true and I've noticed that and learned it a lot from indigenous communities um youth cannot be um we cannot know a lot of things if we don't learn from elders and they also get energy from us so there's a mutual mutually beneficial relationship that we should foster and uh we should foster that in let's say for instance a mutual feedback and dialogue spaces and decision making that includes enough people from both sides and like dialogue in that sense that makes it more horizontal not just have one representative of all youth or whatever because that ends up being a lot of responsibility and it, well it's a minority that's seated on the table instead of promoting like real dialogue between generations which i think it's much more useful and in that sense you can create a common agenda and assign a common budget because without budget there's as we say in colombia in rural colombia like there's no reality as long as you don't have a clear budget like nothing will happen uh, just based on words um and adding to what they said what mirdul and cecil mentioned about um what might be missing i would like to add that um probably adding the concept of so supporting social entrepreneurship and talking about budget could also strengthen the resolution because um it makes having a social enterprise makes you less gives you autonomy um and it creates an idea of abundance and uh yeah it activates more processes just that don't necessarily need to be attached to what's happening in the biggest in the big scale no so um that makes it easier to keep on moving while things move on the international in the international scenario and um just two more things i would like to add there's uh we can also start talking more about causes of peace uh, following what cecil said a while ago uh, instead of causes of violence and conflict like we should insist in that language and think more about how youth can flourish and have meaningful jobs how they can have um how it can they make sense and strengthen their identity because i think as long as people as as long as you know who you are you're not going to let someone else convince you of who you have to be in order to be accept feel accepted feel approved feel masculine having a gun or anything like that so i think uh really focusing on a personal development approach which i know several program 
programs are doing already, but uh, maybe including that in the resolution and uh, as Cecile said a while ago, again, uh, changing the narrative, like improving the narrative that's already that already exists uh, could uh, sum up a lot. And as a strategic idea, I would say journalism is a key it's a key point here, I believe, in media that helps protect youth leaders. Um, so, uh, but, but well, with that one, just to say, um, <laughs> okay, no, I'm gonna leave it there and <laughs> I'll let you continue. Thank you, um, Lorena. We are even still going to unpack many of the things you said about some things that are missing from the resolution. But first, let me remind everyone that is watching right now that you can um, interact with our panelists by dropping your questions in the chat function under the webcast. All right, um, earlier in the conversation, um, Cecile talked about WEPS, that's Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, the, Many people consider WPS as the older, <laughs> older sibling to YPS, you know, and it has been a guiding light for, for the youth peace and security agenda, which we all know is quite a, is still a developing space. Basil, what do you think we can learn from WPS and other inclusive spaces that can be adapted to YPS? What opportunities do you think we need to explore to improve the YPS agenda in general? WPS is definitely the older sister of <laughs> Resolution 2250. I mean, it was an inspiration. Again, it's young people who said, we see how 1325 is useful to women's groups. We want something like that, that will help open the doors for us. Um, so it's really, I mean, the two resolutions or the two agendas are really the two facets of the same coin, and that coin is the inclusivity of peace as a condition for its sustainability. And there's so much that YPS learned from WPS, and first and foremost, the centrality of a gender analysis in everything we do that is related to peace and security. And youth peace and security is fundamentally a gender agenda, because it is about deconstructing violent masculinities and passive femininities. It is about promoting the leadership of young women. It is certainly not about bringing back the emphasis on young men. It's actually deconstructing these stereotypes that are detrimental to all young people, young men who are blocked in this, you know, idea of, you know, violent manhood and young women who are only portrayed as as victims. Um, so that's the very first lesson for from, from WPS. And so what actually happened in 2000 and early 2016, just after the adoption of resolution 2250, as I said earlier, we didn't expect the resolution to be adopted. So it caught all of us by surprise. And so early 2016, the whole coalition of actors working on these issues, we thought, okay, and now what, what do we do? So we thought, well, let's ask women, peace and security colleagues, what's their advice to us? Because it's been 15 years for the, for of implementation of the WPS agenda, let's hear what they have to tell us about what we should do and not do. And they told us a lot of really interesting things that we followed quite uh, scrupulously. They told us build the evidence base, demonstrate, provide evidence, provide data about how young people contribute to peace, which is what we did with the progress study on youth peace and security that Muridul just mentioned that was based on extensive research consultations, country case studies, etc. They said, raise awareness. It's not because you have a resolution that people know it, that people understand it, and that people are going to use it. Take any opportunity you have to make it known, to talk about it, and to bring this narrative forward, which is also something that we, and I say we as it's really the regal, we, <laughs> the whole collective of organizations and partners did with multiple events on youth peace and security, including, um, among others, uh, with USIP. They said prioritize partnership and build coalitions, which is also something in that case that was a condition to the adoption of 2250, but that has continued to be prioritized. And I've mentioned the coalitions at country and regional level. They also say prioritize localization. 
support the work of local actors so that the implementation is bottom up and it's not top down because that's the only way of course it will work and they also say prioritize accountability and monitoring you need concrete indicators you need specific accountability systems you need system-wide action plans so that everybody has the same vision and the same objectives and i would say that is maybe the uh, one part of their advice <clears throat> that we haven't been able to do so much progress on. We've talked a lot about youth-led accountability systems and how can we support young people holding governments, multilateral organizations, including the Security Council accountable for the implementation of 2250, but there's still a lot more work to do there. I think one of the fundamental um, lesson <laughs> that we've, I mean, that we're all learning, WPS and YPS is, how do you keep the balance between the keeping the political edge and the movement that's really behind these agendas? Again, it comes from people who want war to end. That's their agenda. But at the same time, when you want organizations to embrace it, you need also concrete, so smaller scale objectives, right? So you need to be able to say, we're going to increase the number of female in our armed forces. And we need to have to reserve seats for women, young people around the table. So how do you balance the technical checklist approach that is needed for progress to be done? But how do you keep the political momentum and the political edge? That is, I think, the fundamental challenge of these agendas. So if anyone has suggestions, that would be great to hear. And please definitely drop those suggestions in the chat box. We would love to hear your thoughts. Okay, um, so now looking at the YPS, all the resolutions, there are already three resolutions now. Since 2252, other resolutions are followed really quickly in 2018, and we had um, 2535 just this year uh, that was adopted. What do you think um, is missing in these resolutions? Or what do you think needs to be added in future resolutions? I know Lorena has already started touching on those in her earlier contribution, you know, but just in your own opinion, in fact, would you even say we need more resolutions? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, do we need more resolutions? And if we do, what should be in those future resolutions? What do you think is missing in these current resolutions? And again, uh, any of our panelists can answer. Maybe, go. Please go ahead. Go. We need more resolutions. Uh, there's one point that we can think of because the kind of which that we have, it seems to be sufficient in order to do a lot of peace building work in the near future. Uh, but the other mindset also says that we need to have more resolution just so youth peace and security is continuing to be in the discourse and when i'm saying so we need to be very mindful about the political uh, dimension or the divide that the council members have at the security council which is what uh, cecil was mentioning in the beginning uh, so some somehow we need to go beyond that dry, uh, divide because currently that divide is creating a lot of intended and unintended consequences I give you this context. The resolution says that majority of young people are not the victim or perpetrator of violence, but the peace builder or some are, or somewhere living with their own lives, not like in the violence or doing something to uh, not have the conflict. So we are having that kind of dimension. But as much as we are talking about countering violent extremism or preventing violent extremism or counter-terrorism, we are creating something counterproductive. We are creating again and again, or we are highlighting again and again the same perpetrator and victim role. Um, uh, since 9-11, in the same Security Council, we, which has produced three resolutions in last five years, since 9-11, it has created 82 resolutions on counter violent extremism and PV. 82. Every year it is creating four resolutions you see so over the 19 years it is producing every year four resolution at least four or five resolutions but in youth peace and security we are having only three so it seems that we need to produce more so that we we are having more of these conversations otherwise the attention otherwise the, the discourse is going somewhere else 
even after having the same positive discourse in the same uh, um, council. So this is what I feel. Yeah, and adding to that, I would say, um, yeah, it's because the narrative needs to evolve. We need more resolutions uh, in order to speak in a in a way that makes helps youth make more sense and everyone. Because uh, if we emphasize, and I agree with Myrtle, if we emphasize always in countering violent extremism, we're always talking about how to attend disaster. This works like in risk management programs instead of um, real prevention, but prevention not thought only as prevention, but how can we help others really flourish and become themselves and uh, yeah, engage with their surroundings, including nature as a living being to which you should also relate in a peaceful way because um, it is not only between humans, we need to make peace. Uh, so um, I think it's more about how to help youth grow in a meaningful way and not just how to avoid them taking arms because we can be violent in so many ways. Like it is, the, that's why nonviolence, uh, I loved that. David in, opened the, did the introduction and talked about nonviolence because it's not, it's how can we react nonviolently, even with our families? Because I've seen even the root of these violences starts in the families. So how can we have also a family approach? Because many of these youth, uh, at least in Colombia and in general in Latin America, they go out from their houses because they don't feel accepted, they have a violent family, so they just want to go and find a group uh, to belong to, and that's when they get involved in this kind of, uh, um, yeah, um, groups that use arms and drugs. Um, and adding to that, uh, well, in a way, to help protect, I was about to mention the journalism point, I believe that is uh, incredibly important and we need to find a strategic ways for us to go through media and tell our stories um, because um, I, I recently met a social leader in Colombia. He's a well-experienced um, communist leader. Well, I mean, communist, no. He, he belonged to FARC and he's a farmer. Well, the point is, he said something. He said something like, you know, I'm more afraid of someone who knows how to write. Right? Ooh. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Lorena. Ah, sorry. I lost connection for a second. I'm more afraid of someone who knows how to write well and can use a pen than from someone who has a gun. Because responsible journalism he said, journalism has created conflict in Colombia more than anything else, like biased words. So we should also make an emphasis on that, I believe, and look for strategic ways. At least in my case, I try to do, I do travel writing as a side approach to mention things in order to keep myself safe. And uh, also uh, what I like about tourism narratives is that I help people tell their own stories so that doesn't put me at risk, uh, but it's more like a, something that's collective and doesn't have a one single face. So we can look for strategies uh, in terms of media that can strengthen that, our security. And just to finish, I would say, yeah, education of the heart, like let's not forget that approach. Just recalling that His Holiness Dalai Lama. Thank you, Lorena, for mentioning that. Uh, Cecile, do you have anything to add? Uh, we have quite a, a number of questions in the from our audience. Just very briefly, I mean, there's a lot more that resolutions on youth peace and security could say. There's a lot more to say about the role of young women for peace and security. There's a lot more to say around human rights and protection issues. There's a lot more to say on the relationship between climate change and peace and security and the role of young people in raising attention and awareness on all that. There is more operational directions that could be given. And we know that it's not because we have good language that we can't 
go back. And we've seen it actually sadly this year uh, with the 20th anniversary of Resolution 1325 and the failed attempt to have a new resolution on women, peace and security adopted because some council members uh, felt that the proposed text was going was um, going back on um, a, a number of elements that were already acquired. So we have to be we have to keep growing and pushing, um, including at the political level for this agenda. But I just want to end by saying that resolution 2535, which was adopted this summer, really is a fabulous resolution in the sense that it includes all these very operational and concrete elements. It tells the United Nations in particular, do this, develop these guidelines, prioritize protection, uh, uh, point focal points, etc. So these types of resolution really help pave the way to do some very good um, work. So, um, so at least we have a very good foundation to work on. Yeah, agreed. 20, uh, Twenty-five, thirty-five really lays some concrete uh, recommendations, you know, on how to operationalize, you know, the YPS uh, agenda. Somebody is asking in the in the audience. The question is, do you think setting up a specific youth peace security UN fund to support grassroots um, young people's initiative for transformative change, do you think that would help? Dedicated funding on youth peace and security will help, is needed. Um, should it be with the UN? Should it be with other partners? That's another discussion. I mean, we've tried within the UN to get funding allocated to youth-led organizations. And very often it's very complicated because of a number of administrative requirements, donor requirements, etc. Um, but it, it is needed. There are efforts within the UN system, such as the Youth Promotion Initiative from the Peace Building Fund, to allocate funding to civil society organizations so that they can do their work on youth and peace building. But what we've seen is that very often it's very hard for youth organizations to access this funding because they don't have an annual budget of $300,000. They don't have audit reports. They don't have um, all these uh, requirements that are, are normal for a donor, a big donor to ask. So what we need is a, a funding system that is also really tailored to the needs and to the capacities of young people. You know, have them do a proposal through video. Why do you need necessarily a results matrix? Have them do, um, um, uh, you know, monitoring of their projects through, you know, visual based forms, etc. So there's a lot that can be innovated and get that can be thought about. But for sure, we need dedicated funding. Yeah, and just adding to it, um, it should be probably independent and multi partner so that the community itself uh, can own uh, the decision making as well. Thank you. Uh, we are going to the end of our session today, but somebody asked us to reiterate the five pillars. Does anybody want to take that? Or do you want me to, to mention them? Sure. The it's <laughs> participation, partnership, prevention, protection, disengagement, and reintegration. Thank you so much, Mido. And thank you all to all our panelists for joining us today. It's been a really engaging conversation with you all. And um, see you another time. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Bye for now. Thank you so you. much. And, and I send a big hug for everyone to everyone from the Colombian Amazon. Thank you. Bye.